Hey everybody, it's Allison Harrell with the Fort Bend Museum, and today we are talking all about trains. So specifically today we're talking about the history of the train engine itself. So instead of going over like the evolution of the machine through the years, we're actually going to go over the inventor to help this machine become reality. So we're going to go over brief little snapshots on a number of different people before we get to the final train engine. Most of these inventors, until I say otherwise, are going to be English. So if I don't say where they're from, just assume it's England. Okay, let's get started. So the first inventor we need to talk about today is Thomas Savory. He was born in 1650 and he died in 1715. And he created the very first steam powered machine. And this machine was invented in 1698 and did not have a single moving part, which is frankly quite an accomplishment. <laughs> so steam would fill up a vessel and then the vessel would be let down into water that needed to be pumped. The vac a vacuum was formed and the water would fill up the vessel and then the vessel would be removed from the water and the process would be repeated over and over and over again. This machine used a whole lot of coal, and it moved only a small amount of water at one time. Now, the entire reason this machine was created was to pump water. Thomas Savory didn't have any grand mechanical or engineering aspirations. He was just looking to solve a very real problem, which is that a lot of coal mines flood. So he was trying to find a way to more efficiently pump water out of a coal mine, and that's exactly what his machine did. Now, the next person is Thomas Newcomen. He was born in 1664 and he died in 1729. He was an ironmonger by trade, a lay preacher by calling, and an Englishman by birth. So flooding in coal and tin mines was a major problem. So he saw Thomas Savory's machine and decided to improve upon it. His ironmonger business specialized in designing, manufacturing, and selling tools for mining, so creating a new and improved design was right up his alley. In 1712, his device for pumping water was created. He added one moving piston, and he improved on the efficiency of the machine, so it could pump a little bit more water at a time. Next up, we have James Watt. He was born in 1763 and died in 1819. He was a Scottishman. He was a Scottish inventor, mechanical engineer, and a chemist. He started out by trying to find a more efficient engine because the contemporary design involved repeatedly cooling and then reheating a cylinder. So he introduced a separate condenser to the equation. This improved the power, efficiency, and cost effectiveness of the entire device. He also figured out how to add rotary motion. So he got the piston to move up and down and attached a wheel to it and got the wheel to move around as well. He partnered with Matthew Bolton in 1775 and they ran a successful company based on his designs. So now we're going to move on from just the steam engine to the more train engine sort of inventors. And the first one that we need to talk about is William Murdoch. Now, William Murdoch was born in 1754. He is technically the third of seven p uh, children born to his parents, but he was the first to survive infancy. So he's basically the eldest child in his family. He was born in Luger, Scotland. Um, he did die in 1839, but he worked for Bolton and Watt. So that James Watt we just talked about, he worked for him. Now, um, he, when he went to apply for a job with James Watt, he walked into the interview wearing a wooden hat that he designed and built himself made on a lathe that he designed and built himself. And I'm not saying that the hat was the entire reason he got the job, but it was quite an impressive feature and it definitely didn't hurt. Now, I have a couple of quotes that James Watt said about Murdoch. So I'm going to read those right now so you get a better sense of who this man was. So Watt wrote in 1778, if William Murdoch is not at home, he should be sent for immediately, as he understands the patterns and care must be taken to avoid mistakes of which our engine shop has been too guilty. Now in 1779, Bolton wrote to Watt and said, I think William Murdoch is a valuable man and deserves every civility and encouragement. 
So that should give you an idea of just how esteemed he was in this circle of inventors of engines. Murdoch became invaluable to Bolton and Watt. He would maintain all the engines in the area, and he single-handedly made each he was responsible for more efficient. So every time he'd fix them, he'd improve them just a little bit. He also checked engines for patent infringement. So if they felt someone was stealing their engine, they could send Murdoch to check it out, and he could pretty quickly tell if someone had stolen their designs. Now, in March of 1784, Murdoch began working on a steam locomotive. He made a model that would run around his living room in a little circle. This was the first recorded example in Great Britain of a man-made machine moving on its own power. So this little device was a three-wheeled one. It was about a foot tall with an engine and a boiler placed between two larger back wheels with a lamp to heat the water and a tiller in front turning the small front wheel. So it's sort of like a really, really tiny powered car, essentially. Next, we're going to make a little jump across the pond because we finally have an American to talk about. So John Fitch was born in 1743 and he died in 1798. He was an American inventor, clockmaker, entrepreneur, and engineer. He operated the first steamboat service in the United States. He actually made a number of improvements to steam engines, which is quite a feat considering that he wasn't allowed to see the latest model of steam engine at that time. James Watt's steam engines at this time were on the cutting edge of technology, but England was very, very selfish with its new inventions and machines, especially engines. So they wouldn't let anything like a steam engine leave England because then people might steal their ideas. So people like John Fitch had a really hard time improving something when they weren't allowed to see it. But he actually did manage to improve a bit on James Watt's steam engine. Now, John Fitch made two working models of steam locomotives, but they just never really took off. Now, after our brief moment in American inventors, we're hopping back across the pond, back to another English inventor. And it's time to talk about Richard Trevithick. So Richard Trevithick was born April 13th, 1771 in Cornwall, England. He was the fifth of six children, but the only boy. Now, he was educated in the local schools, but he really only had an affinity for math and for sports. Um, he arrived at the correct answer incredibly unconventionally. So he may get to the right answer, but he's not going to do it the way you would expect him to. Now, his father worked in a mine, and Richard would go with his dad and watch the steam engines pump water. And he was also very heavily influenced by William Murdoch, because William Murdoch lived right around the corner from him. So Richard Trevithick started working for a mine, and he quickly rose in the ranks. Now, he married Jane Harvey in 1797, and they had six children together. Also in 1797, he became an engineer at the Ding Dong Mine. So he started working with high-pressure steam engines, and this was all to avoid having to pay royalties to James Watt. So high-pressure engines would eliminate the condenser because it would allow for a smaller cylinder, which would save space and weight. The exhaust was vented via vertical pipe or chimney to avoid the condenser. So by sort of slightly redesigning the engine and by using this high-pressure steam, he was able to consider it a whole new invention, a whole new engine, if you will. So Richard Trevithick built a full-size road locomotive in 1801 near present-day 4th Street at Cambor. It was called the Puffing Devil. On Christmas Eve, it carried six people up the street in England. His cousin Andrew Vivian was the one steering it. This was the first demonstration of transportation powered by steam. So his engine broke down three days later because it was left running while everyone went to eat lunch and the engine exploded. Uh, this he considered to be operator error, not an issue on his designs part. And he did take out a patent on this design in 1802. So Richard Trevithick built another engine in 1803. He called it the London Steam Carriage, which was an improvement on the Puffing Devil. He drove this one from Holborn to Paddington and back, which is about three miles. It was expensive to run and really uncomfortable to ride on. 
One of his stationary's pumping engines exploded and killed four people in the same year. And so Walt and Watt and Bolton used this incident to show that Richard Trevithick's engines were just, they were just dangerous and no one should use them. So that was their campaign against him, was that his engines were dangerous and no one should use them. So you should not use the high pressure steam that he was using. You should use the Watt and Bolton engines. Now, Trevithick once again considered this to be operator error, but he did start adding safety valves to his designs so that the, even though he kept using the high pressure steam, it was a little bit safer. Now, Trevithick sold a patent for his locomotives to Samuel Humphrey in 1803. Humphrey bet Richard Crawshay 500 guineas that Trevithick's locomotive could haul 10 tons of iron 9.75 miles. On February 21st, 1804, the engine carried 10 tons of iron, five wagons, and 70 men, the 9.75 miles in four hours and five minutes. Now, the track wasn't made to support this though, so while the engine made it, the track didn't do so well as a result. In 1808, Richard Trevithick built a new locomotive called Catch Me Who Can. It was named by a friend's daughter, in case you're wondering. He ran it on a circular track and he charged people to ride it. It didn't really get the response that he wanted. He was looking for more of a commercial venture, but um, it did sort of pick up a little bit of steam, if you will. He continued to invent and improve on other designs, and then he died on April 22nd, 1833, in Danford of pneumonia. The next inventor we need to talk about is George Stevenson. He was born in 1781, and he died in 1848. He was illiterate until the age of 18, when he paid someone to educate him. He married Frances Henderson in 1802, and they had one son, Robert. Now, George Stevenson invented a safety lamp for miners in 1815. It was concurrent with another, and he was actually accused of stealing the design for his safety lamp. Now, the other inventor in question did not believe for one second that a non-scientist could have made anything. Stevenson was ultimately proved correct, but he gained this intense distrust of scientists as a result. He designed his first locomotive in 1814. It was for hauling coal, and he solved the rail issues that arrived slash arose at the time. So George Stevenson built an eight mile railway in 1820. He was hired to build the Stockton and Darlington Railway in 1821. This would be the first public steam railway in the world. He was also in charge of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway. He had to resurvey the entire route because it was done incorrectly the first time. There was a competition held to see who would build the locomotives for this railroad in 1829. And um, George's son, Robert, actually designed and built a locomotive called Rocket. Now, Robert was educated both by institutions and by on-the-job training with his father and others. He had spent the previous three years as an engineer in Columbia, South America. So let's talk about the rocket locomotive itself. It wasn't the first locomotive, but it combined four inventions together to become the most advanced locomotive of its day. It was the template for steam engines for the next 150 years. And in the competition to see who would power the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, the rocket won. Now, George Stevenson is considered the father of the railways. He and his son, Robert, both continued to work in railroads, and they were sought after and praised for both their work and their knowledge. George died in 1848, and his son, Robert, died in 1859. By the early 1850s, Great Britain had over 7,000 miles of railway. This was only 20 years after the first public railway was even built. Now, let's talk a little bit about trains coming to America. Okay, so in America, as I previously mentioned, England was super secretive about all of their new designs and their new engines and their new machines. They didn't want anyone else to know about all of their great advancements. 
So, the first American-built steam locomotive to operate on a common carrier railroad was the Tom Thumb. This was designed and built by Peter Cooper in 1830. It raced against a horse-drawn carriage. Now, the Tom Thumb suffered a mechanical failure and the horse actually won the race, but it did prove the concept that steam locomotion was effective. It was made a proof of concept and it wasn't saved, so we don't have the Tom Thumb anymore. They actually scrapped the entire locomotive and used it to build other things. Now, up until this point, innovation in steam locomotion had been made only in England. In 1830, in New York, a locomotive was built for a South Carolina canal and railroad company. This was the first fully built in America locomotive. It was shipped to South Carolina and it was christened the best friend of Charleston. Its inaugural, inaugural run was on Christmas Day of 1830. This was considered the fastest mode of transportation of the day and it could go a whopping 15 to 25 miles an hour. So on June 17, 1831, it became the first American locomotive to suffer a boiler explosion. Someone closed the steam pressure valve because the noise was annoying to them. And this valve was one of those safety valves that um, Richard Trevithick added because of just such reasons, safety. Now, from, it was from that point on that cotton bales were actually placed between the engine and the passengers. So it was just one of the ways that they solved this problem was by keeping the passengers away from the locomotive so that they don't get annoyed by small noises like safety valves. And also the cotton bales served as a buffer. So just in case the locomotive did happen to explode, there was a bit of a safety buffer so the passengers would probably be okay. So that is my entire brief, quick history of the steam locomotive. So we went from steam engine to locomotive itself, and we even got them all the way to America. So hope to see you next week. Bye.